really do appreciate the opportunity today. I I uh, I want to thank um, Chris for asking me to do this. Uh, Mike for all your help getting logistics to premiere as well for your for your help. Uh, just uh, the work you guys do in the uh, LED is amazing. Um, and I think I think that um, the one thing that we're going to see today, I hope, is that you guys come away with an understanding of how we can implement um, this concept of true north. Um, in service industries, you know, we talk about ocean connery and strategy deployment. We, we think about that in terms of manufacturing, and and uh, but this concept of really understanding where the business is heading and um, works equally well in um, service businesses, those transactional businesses. As Mike yeah, mentioned, um, yep, I've done a, a good bit of stuff. Really blessed. I consider myself blessed to be able to uh, to go train and facilitate this stuff every day. And I consider myself a practitioner of true spirit of continuous improvement. So when you see the ASQ Master Black Belt number eight up there, and then you know that I'm a member of the Six Sigma Forum, you also need to know that I am equally passionate about lean and theory of constraints and, and all those things that go along with it. And I think that's important, important to note that we as practitioners, when we go out each and every day, we go out trying to help the businesses in the best way, in the most effective way, and, and it really should involve all the tools in our toolbox, um, whether it be uh, a very basic uh, process mapping uh, Kaizen, uh, looking at the current state, taking it apart, putting it back together uh, into a proof future state, all the way up to and including um, the most advanced uh, master black belt level um, highly analytical projects using lots of statistics or whatever. I, I think that's our challenge as practitioners of this stuff, is really just, just having that toolbox ready and knowing then what tools help an organization take the next step. And in, in this case today, we're going to see um, a story about air hygiene um, as this transactional business is going to think about applying, um, uh, think about applying this, this concept of strategy for the business. And I really, I, it, it kills me to do these webinars because I really like to hear back from people um, along the way. So if you have something you'd like to, uh, to share with uh, me, then I'll bring it up to the group. I would uh, be very much uh, open to you uh, putting that in the chat box down below and sending it to me um, as the panelist. Um, that would be super. And you can send it to the organizer and panelist. Uh, anyway, I really do like the uh, interactive style, the communicative style, the collaborative style. So the one-way communication sometimes is like talking into a box. So <laughs> anyway, I want to do the best job I can servicing, uh, servicing you guys today. So thanks again for the opportunity. Um, everybody. You guys need to know a little bit about me. Not only am I an Astro Black Belt and, and all that kind of good business, but I'm also an aviation nut. And that's right. The bottom right airplane is it started from the stuff on the trailer, the top right. Um, love to fly. My little uh, two and a half year old loves to fly. My ten year old loves to fly as well, as well as my wife. We kind of go along around and have a good time. It's crazy to love the small airplane. It's a good, good, good option. I also love to play music. Uh, yep, that's right. That's track one I'm holding there. I'm sure there's some fellow musicians out there. It's kind of crazy. So just getting to know me, you guys uh, got to understand that uh, you know continuous improvement is one of uh, a number of passions. Family, family of course, being uh, being uh, there as well. There's my two kids um, on the right hand side, and my wife there on the left. My wife and I are actually getting ready to leave our 20th anniversary trip this uh, Saturday. We're heading over to Africa. Uh, should, should be a little bit of fun there. Um, doing some safari stuff and, and doing some mission work over there, so be all that. As I mentioned, we're going to start with air hygiene stories. I'm going to tell you a little bit about kind of where they started, where they began, um, what their focus was. I'm going to give you a little bit of background on their business so you kind of understand what they do. Um, we're going to talk about how they implemented strategy deployment in their business very specifically. And I've already worked it out with Mike so that we can make sure and get you guys this presentation. So if there's something that you see and you're like, oh man, we just skipped over that too quickly or whatever whatever um, uh, is going on there, no trouble. We can, uh, you guys will have the presentation, you can you can certainly uh, refer back to it. But I also want to make known that, that I'm here to help um, if, for instance, I've, I've delivered this presentation a number of times before. If, for instance, um, you're saying, man, I wish I really had that Excel sheet or whatever, um, I'd be honored to send that to you. So just uh, reach out to Mike, uh, Chris, or Samir. Uh, either way, or me directly, whatever, and I can send you the uh, send you the forms that we use. Happy to do that. What do you need to know about Air Hygiene? They are an international service firm 
that goes out and collects emissions from stationary sources. And they collect these emissions in ways that are random and representative to truly represent the emission levels coming from, uh, from these particular sources. So things like power plants and um, acid production facilities and chemical plants and even cement kilns when they're talking about how many particulates that are going up into the atmosphere. That's the work they do. They go out and they basically, they're, they're in the business of providing data to their clients that satisfy the requirements of EPA or local or state agencies. It's interesting, air hygiene over 15 years has grown from a team of two to over 50. That's pretty quick growth. Um, it's been strategically driven, but mostly what we'll see is it's been strategically driven by one key person that's been there and he's the president. You can see though, one of the challenges as they continue to grow is that they, they had an entrepreneurial spirit at their base, at their foundation. They wanted to drive some level of structure around that to make sure that they preserve that. And certainly driving continuous improvement culture is very important. Now you need to know this presentation was actually delivered at the Lean Six Sigma conference in 2013. So this work is actually work that we did in the tail end of 2012. Um, last year, the tail end of 2013, we got together again and we have revised their current strategy deployment. We've actually, that was their, that was their annual checkup. And we've done some additional, uh, additional work, some really good work. And they're continuing to use this process as their core, um, core tool to drive strategic thinking. So, so the, the, it continues to grow and continues to build momentum there for them. Um, and I'm going to try my best to weave in some of the more recent stories today into this presentation as well. As I mentioned, these folks are in the business of stack testing. Um, I hope you can see my mouse. If you can, this is their typical emissions testing trailer um, that they would actually pull on site. Obviously, you pull with the truck. There they are. Um, this is a stack, so it's, it's at the exit of, in this case, this is a gas, a gas turbine that, uh, that spins a generator. Anyways, they, they come up here on this catwalk, and these are the sample ports where they would actually collect the samples. Same thing over here represented. These guys are up on some catwalks here. This is where they collect the sample, and they convey it down to the trailer. So when you talk about things like continuous improvement, you know, things right away, for instance, like setup reduction. Setup reduction is very, very important for them. When they when they show up on site, they want to be testing as quickly as possible. Same thing for teardown. So when they get ready to demobilize, right, having a place for everything and everything in its place. But also it blends the elements of quality quite nicely because we talk about data collection and how do we make sure that the data is random and representative and effective for so, you know a ballot for so, so what they're claiming. So um, anyways, it's a nice blend of all those true spirit and continuous improvement elements, just the way their business is naturally structured. By the way, down here at the bottom, this is their beautiful facility. Um, it's a couple years old now. Uh, the president describes that when they built it, they built it as if it was their home they were going to going to retire in. So um, anyways, it's very very nice. They're in beautiful place, and I really like home. Air hygiene, as I mentioned, this is the need for strategy deployment. The air hygiene is growing. And Quinn specifically, right, Quinn, the president, he found it more and more difficult to know um, where the organization was collectively heading. In other words, when I say that, I'm really trying to trying to speak to the fact that there were lots of different thoughts about where the organization was going, but not one cohesive plan, not one cohesive direction. That's really this, this understanding about a true north. And the other thing, too, this, this second point down here, the lack of group autonomy. Know something that Quinn noted. A lot of people were waiting on Quinn to make a decision for their particular area of responsibility or next step because that's the way it had always been done. So they found themselves at this really interesting tipping point where Quinn had to do something different. He couldn't be in all the places that he was needed any longer. And certainly in terms of their top line areas of focus, uh, in a lot of regards it was unknown where they needed to go focus those top level improvement priorities as we often refer to them. So the last point though that's most important is that air hygiene has been built on a culture of entrepreneurial uh, leadership, but also servant leadership. That's an important set of values for them and morals. And, and they found it more and more difficult, in fact, to try to convey that, that message over and over. And so how do you bring on new people and try to instill the leadership um, into mm -hmm. them as servant leadership or the, the, the idea of entrepreneurialism? And so that was a key element to what they were, what they were wanting to work on here as well. As a result of uh, as a result of strategy deployment, so Quinn's vision. I, I really thought this was pretty cool, and I'll read this to you just because it's worth talking about. One month after rolling out strategy deployment, you can see here this is the tail end of uh, 
of 2012 that I mentioned. He said this to his uh, leadership team. Thank you for participating in this exercise. From time to time, it may seem laborious, monotonous, repetitive, and or wasteful. Trust me, it is not. We are like infants playing with a new toy, but soon enough, these metrics are going to really hum and give us give all of us powerful knowledge and understanding of our company, industry, and business. That will spread to the employees, and that knowledge and understanding is going to be incredibly powerful. Now, I'm going to fast forward to, uh, actually, it was just uh, last week, I guess, I was um, at our hygiene event together and, and focused on a, a brand new area of business that they've gone off into, and that's actually emissions testing on drill ships. Um, so, in short, they build basically a system, and they go and install it on a drill ship, and any time the drill ship is in, in the waters that has a, an environmental permit, they have to uh, have this emission uh, equipment in place and running. Anyways, um, it was really cool. I got to sit in there uh, into their operations review, and for those of you that are familiar with strategy deployment, you know that frequent and, uh, and uh, consistent follow-up is a requirement, right? So, they've actually set up a monthly schedule, and they have their operations review. They had it last Friday, and it's really interesting for them to talk now. I just sat off to the side and listened. They talk now about their metrics, about understanding the business in a way that they were unable to do at the tail end of uh, 2012. It really has driven incredible value for them in terms of being able to really understand their business. You know, we talk about so much about going to Gimba and really, really gaining that understanding of how things tick and how the processes interrelate. And this, uh, this concept of strategy deployment, Hoach and Connery, has, has absolutely been one of the key tools for them as a leadership team to understand how the business processes are like and how they, uh, how they should measure their success, uh, both in terms of forward looking and, and backward looking metrics. So, what is strategy deployment? For those of you that might not be very familiar with it, it's uh, something called Hoach and Connery. Uh, or policy deployment, oftentimes referred to, and it's been in, in place since the, uh, since the late 50s. Uh, here's a quote from Yoji Akeo. Hoshin Connery is a method devised to capture and submit strategic goals as well as flashes of insight about the future and to develop the means to bring these into reality. So much like, you know, future state value stream mapping, I, I think that Hoshin Connery is something that, that is almost a foundational tool for an organization. You can see here, it, it's really talking about Ruling together or cementing these strategic goals and flashes of insight about the future. But then the cool thing about it, much like value stream mapping does for us, is it, it gives us the means to bring these elements into reality. So as we gain that flash of insight about what the future might be, we then develop those improvement priorities and the ways to measure success that are going to help us bring that reality into, uh, into fruition in a, in a few years. And I, I man, that is so incredible. I and mean, I think Quinn really gets it. The leadership team over at Air Hygiene get, get it. Um, for those of you that have not experienced true strategy deployment yet, um, I recommend that you, uh, you do what you got to do to uh, start thinking like this. I think this is something that's going to be very, very valuable. Very, very valuable for you. So, who uses it? When we look at, when we look at the list, there's, there's, there's a lot of very large organizations that use it. You can see we've got uh, Nissan and Toyota. Adele, uh, Pinterest Corporation is actually where I learned strategy deployment, ironically enough. Uh, Bank of America, uh, Sega, we've got Bridgestone, uh, CI Solutions, Nissan, uh, Danaher, for those of you that might have been around the Danaher, um, the DDS, the Danaher Business System, it's a big deal. Um, this is, this is the way, this is the way of the future in terms of uh, running a business. And it's really good stuff. And feel free again, remember folks, use that chat uh, chat box there, send it to the panelists and organizers if you'd like. If there's any sort of flash of insight you'd like for me to share with the group, I'd be honored to do so. Um, especially maybe if you've, if you've been in a company with a strategy deployment, you'd like to share who that was, or maybe if there's something about strategy deployment you think is real good for us to, uh, to cover at this point. So what we did, um, it's interesting, you know, the power of Kaizen just continues to amaze me. Um, in terms of the ability it has to rally a team around a goal or a series of goals and um, get strategic work done. And yeah, we're stretching the boundaries a little bit potentially for Kaizen, but I think at the end of the day, when I look at, uh, at PDCA, Plan B Check Act, there's nothing, there's no better method in my mind's eye to um, accomplish a strategy deployment creation and implementation. 
So what we did, we, we did all these things listed down here at the bottom. We started um, in the PDCA, the, the Kaizen event, we started by kind of taking apart or understanding what their existing values are and what their existing mission was. And, and then we, we developed the X chart. For those of you that have been around strategy deployment before, you're probably familiar with it. For those who haven't, um, you'll reckon, if you get involved in one of these, you'll know that you end up turning your head crooked trying to read around this X as you go around this sheet. Um, we also then thought about, the, or didn't think about it, we created the bowling chart and the root cause and countermeasure sheet for those times that we might miss that particular strategic deployment metric. And uh, at any rate, those, that's the work we did. And I'm going to dig in deeper so you'll get to see a little bit of each one of those examples, how we did them. Okay, so first things first. We wanted to understand what was the value. By the way, these are the uh, these are the folks seated around the table. These are all the directors at Air Hygiene. I'm in their beautiful building. They've got pictures all around of not facts that they tested, but other cities that they tested in. It's very, very cool. Um, here's Quinn Beerman, the president. Here's his brother Swanson. And then most of these, these guys around the table are college buddies or, or whatever. They've just kind of grown up that way. It's very, very cool. It's a neat business. Uh, we started by brainstorming all of their values. We said, guys, you guys have been here since the beginning. Uh, most all of them have been, you know, 12, 13 years anyway. What's important to you at Air Hiking, right? What do you hold near and dear to your heart? So we brainstormed a list of all those values, and we developed an affinity diagram um, where we collaborated and collected the main categories for um, each one of those each one of those uh, elements, the values. And then we built the mission statement using those individual those individual groupings. Here's an, here's what we did. Here's exactly what we did. Um, you can see that these ideas here um, rolled up into this one concept, and we'll talk about what PTO is here in just a second. This is the concept of what we're paying for, um, dignified character, anyway, so on and so forth. And by the way, we also individually we, we did some nominal group technique and did some multi voting and came up with a rank score of which value up here, which group of values is is the most important group for you. And that became important because we were able to very quickly then as a group say, okay, well, this is the most important one for the business. By the way, this happens to be extra mile customer service. And right behind that is family oriented. Kind of interesting. Again, a very neat business. This is the list. These are their eight core values of doing business. Second to none. Extra mile customer service. Dignified character. Family oriented principles. Unmatched quality, worth paying for every time, revolutionary technology, best educated workforce. So out of the brainstorm list and in through the affinity diagramming process, we found that there were eight main core values that were critical to the business. And then they were very clever as well. And they also spelled the word commission, which I think is funny, um, esteem, motivation, integrity, sentiment, superiority, investment, operation, and nobleness. You know, it was kind of funny. So they, they did that at a good time. I think it's a good deal. From that, though, they developed their mission statement. And I think this is important, again, to read because we've got to know what we're starting with. We'll get to the vision. That's going to be the whole strategy deployment portion. Remember, we're doing this within the Kaizen event. And my hope for you today is that you see through through this discussion, through this presentation, how Air Hygiene went about applying strategy deployment or creating their strategy deployment um, and rolling it out. They developed this mission statement. Air Hygiene's core philosophy is second to none. I told you it's too too low. I tell you what that meant. That means second to none. Uh, demands extra mile customer service anchored on dignified character and family oriented principles to deliver unmatched, stack, unmatched quality stack testing worth paying for every time. Supporting this mission, we utilize revolutionary technology in Air Hygiene University to create the best educated workforce to define the future of stack testing. And so there it is, right? There's all our eight elements. Bam, bam, bam. We've got two sentences here. And, it, you know, I guess we were done with this probably by the end of day one. I and mean, then we came back and reviewed it at the beginning of day two um, as part of the Kaizen event. But now we have this, we knew what we needed to do, right? We knew what air hygiene was in the business to do. Um, pretty cool, pretty cool little process here. It worked out very well. From there, we then worked through the seven steps of deploying the strategy. A little different than normal, you know. We, we didn't practice the catch ball process. Um, like some organizations do, like we did when I was at uh, when I was at Pentair. Um, we didn't we didn't practice that because Quinn was in there, and as we began to understand the breakthrough objectives and think about 
think about our annual breakthrough objectives and the, what would be measured these uh, strategy deployment metrics. We were playing catch ball right there in the session. So I just want to highlight that for you. If you've done the catch ball process before, this was done real time in the week. Um, we did establish the top level improvement priorities within the week. We thought about the primary and second uh, dairy responsibilities to establish who was responsible for it and who's going to be uh, assisting. Um, we built bowling charts, uh, the one main bowling chart where, where we had progress green deserves no focus in this particular month and red. We deserve all the focus. So, so and, and then certainly for those items that we found ourselves in the red, we utilized the root cause and countermeasure too. And this is an in interesting statistic and, and I heard it I heard it repeated um, at the Lean Six Sigma conference in twenty thirteen about the ratio between forward looking and historical uh, metrics. Um, we want to spend most of our most of our time not talking about what happened in the past the reasons why John was shot, but what we're going to do about it, what we're going to do to prevent Joe from getting shot next time. So um, that's a that's a critical one. I want I want you guys to think about that. So let's take a look. We're going to dive in a little bit to the seat. Dive in a little bit to the seat. I keep looking over here to the right. I've got to find my cell phone app with the clock on it. So I'm making sure I'm staying on task and on target at the time. This is the first area we focus. We list here. We list here those things that the organization determines are breakthrough objectives. Right. So in this area down here at the bottom, these are the three to five year breakthrough objectives, where we need to be in three to five years. And a lot of organizations utilize these five main pillars to define their breakthrough objectives. Growth, safety, quality, delivery, and cost. So those five main elements, typically they will build their three to five year breakthrough objectives around that. Now here's a point of caution about this. Because we're starting with three to five here, we're getting ready to go to annual next. What can happen if you put too many here is that it will explode in annual, and by the time you get around to measuring it all and deciding on the top level improvement priorities, you'll have way more than the organization can focus on. So, so what I want you guys to think about here is that we need to keep it simple. Um, less is better. Less drives a deeper and more refined focus. Um, the challenge is, is making sure that what we choose, right, the ones that really do matter or the ones we really do elect, to go focus on, but truly those are the main drivers of the business, and that's why it's so critical we start with the values and mission to make sure we understand what the organization values and where we're heading. Next part, develop the annual breakthrough objectives. So that's where we would think about then, we would think about, well, this is where we want to be in three to five years. What does the end of year one look like? So one year from now, what are those things that we expect to have achieved? And consequently, each month over the next year, what will we choose to measure? Again, the statistic is about uh, about 80% forward-looking, 20% backward-looking. So think about your dashboard on your car. You glance down and you see if you're in in the speed limit or not. Which unfortunately, sometimes I'm not. Yeah, I just got a good driving award not too long ago for that. So I had to subsidize the flower bed in West Salem Springs, Arkansas, for the summer. So anyways, that's what I get. But uh, at any rate, um, you think about think about the annual those those measurements you're going to do over the annual basis, do once a month, and uh, again, 20% historical, right, rearward looking, and 80% forward looking. Some people use a 30-70, um, uh, but it's just 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 a rule of thumb. So it's just good thing to do. Primarily, you want to be more forward looking than backward looking. Um, then you think about you think about those things that you commit to do in terms of the top level improvement priorities. These may be big processes that you need to go understand more about. Maybe you need to do value stream mapping. Or maybe you've got a, uh, a Lean Six Sigma project that you've got to go do um, to eliminate or to reduce defects in a particular product line. Uh, these are the big bucket strategic elements. Maybe there's a new element of IT infrastructure that needs to be implemented or maybe a new ERP system that's got to be rolled out. Um, or a new CRM system for customer resource management, whatever it is, it, that's that's what we that's what we put there. Over here on this, remember this is in order. This is how we progress through the week. We started here with annual breakthrough objectives, went over to the KPIs, then jumped up to the top, the top level improvement priorities, and then defined the list of those that are responsible. These are all the leadership, all the members of the leadership team, and then we played in these areas at the corners. These are interrelationship uh, matrices. The darkened circles show primary responsibility, and the open circles show secondary responsibility. Those responsibilities 
or I should say relationships, secondary relationships, right? That there may be, they may be tied together, but may not be. And I apologize for not showing you the tail here. Obviously, air hygiene being in business, um, out of respect to them, I didn't want to show all the all the inner workings of their business, which, as you know or could imagine, um, a strategy department matrix really does show the inner workings of the business quite well. So that's it. Up through step five, we're going to go through step seven or step six now. This is the bowling chart. This is where we identified the resource again that had it. And remember step five or step three back here on this previous page, we had created a list of all those things that we knew would be the right things to measure that if we were in the green every month, we'd have no trouble achieving our annual breakthrough objectives that would ultimately help us get to our three to five year breakthrough objectives. See how this works? What we did then is we transferred these measurements, these strategy deployment metrics, we transferred them into a bowling chart and we understood which annual objective each one was tied to and what the metric was, again, not listed here, but you get the idea. In fact, you can even see these, these blue bars or these teal bars. These actually match here and here, so those are both comms. Anyways, we would then look across and see this. We would establish the annual plan. This is what we're striving to achieve each and every month with a quarterly roll-up and a year-to-date total. And some of these are cumulative where it's adds each month, and some of them are on average where we're looking at the average performance for each month. But you can see here, this is count, this is all this kind of business here. That was that was what was on the bowling chart. And then for each one of these targets, we also then developed a root cause and countermeasure sheet that would actually plot the performance of that metric in the upper right and again have a very similar string of information if you look at this 15, 50, whatever this is, it's not shown in this particular sheet, but it's as if we took this row like these two rows and we just copied it over here onto this sheet. The importance of the root cause and countermeasure sheet is this. We establish what we're going to measure or the target that we need to achieve each and every month. And if for whatever reason we do not reach that metric, the person responsible is responsible for for developing, and it may be co-developed with other areas in the organization, let me be very clear, but they are accountable for developing a good list of what happened, the root cause, and more importantly, what we're going to do about it. Remember the ratio, we're going to spend about 20% of our time looking backward and about 80% of our time looking forward. You can see here, this is the list right here, the list of those things that they're going to do and who's responsible, the target dates for completion, and then the status. Critical that in this sheet right here, that this be a running list of open items. So I may be in the red for this month, this particular month here, which is August, and I may also be in the red for September. I would have a list of things that I would have assigned in August and in September, and I'm going to keep those on the list until they're complete. And I'll manage it over here with the status. Very, very important if you work your business like that. We certainly don't want to grow organizational and, and media. That's not a good thing at all. So they now have their true north. You can see a critical aspect of their business is learned through strategy deployment. They learned that defects are a critical driver to their profitability. That was something they, they had a fundamental basic understanding of, but they had no idea as to what level of impact. They also recognize that having the right people on staff and keeping them on staff is critical. Being strategic about their mix of projects is also very, very important. So kind of that input side of it, recognizing that whatever they go out and sell is going to drive a lot of profitability. In fact, mix we found over the last year and a half, in fact, mix is one of the most important things to drive profitability. And it's still a knob that they're, they're feverishly working to turn. It's a hard knob to turn, just based off of the way the... Uh, projects are awarded across the United States and across the uh, industry as a whole. Developing and adhering to standards is a must, so we've got to continue to grow that as well. Um, they also do a monthly review now. They have objectives for the year that they manage, those strategy deployment um, uh, metrics. And then they think about and very, very deeply dive into the misses of the plan. They understand the root cause and the countermeasures. But remember, they only talk about those metrics that they miss. So the metrics that they were in the green, they skip over them and they move on. They now effectively establish an action plan, leader responsible target completion date. They then review any remaining mm -hmm. open items during the next month's review. And this is where I'm going to throw in some new stuff here. As of, as work um, from last 
fall, if you've read Stephen Spears' book, um, The High Velocity Edge, um, Air Hygiene, in their, in their annual review for their strategy deployment, determined that they wanted a zero defect mentality to roll out through the organization. It's not, a, you know, not a, uh, an easy task, as you guys can imagine. But they, they patterned it after they all read uh, Stephen Spears' book before the strategy deployment session. I think that's a good recommendation. Find a book um, that you have your leadership team read before you actually um, um, in, embark on this. In this case, we decided that, that the high velocity edge was something that they wanted to pursue, and they, they really got tired of doing work around. That was prim primarily the reason. So as a result of their strategy deployment session this last year, they determined that they wanted to create a new process called a form. And I'm hoping to write something up on that later on this uh, summer and actually present it maybe at the Lean Six Sigma conference in, uh, in next spring. But uh, at any rate, uh, more to come on that. They're the first team that I know of that have developed a process called a form specific to uh, what Stephen was talking about in his book. If you haven't read the book, certainly do so. It's a great, uh, great discussion on true spirit of continuous improvement, doing what's right for the business, and making sure we root out those opportunities where organizations have to work around bad processes to try to get things done. So certainly a great way to eliminate waste. At any rate, so there's a little bit of an update for you. So I would be curious, and this is, this is kind of logistically, you know, here, Mike, you might have to help me here. Um, why is it important for an organization to have a true north? That's the question I'm posing to the group, and I don't know if it's possible for you maybe to type back a response to me, but the question's out there. So let's take just a second here, a couple seconds, see if I get anybody responding. Why is it important for an organization to have a true north? Why do you think? Okay, well, one of them, a uh, constancy of purpose. Ah, absolutely. Um, without a true, uh, without a true north, any path will do. Good point. <laughs> very, very good point. Focus on too many things, then nothing gets accomplished. Oh, wow. Absolutely. Sure. Uh, so everyone is facing the same direction, yeah. working to a common goal. Uh, focus. One person said focus. <clears throat> Minimize risk. Ah, okay. Very, very important. All those are great responses. You know, I, I think that it's very important for us to. Uh, I, I just, in general, try to drive our businesses with this with this strategic focus. So, um, you know, I, again, Mike, thanks for reading those. We're we're going to do this again in a little bit. So keep the comments coming, Mike. If you wouldn't mind, feel free to kind of police those for whatever reason. I'm un unable to see them, but uh, police those comments. If there's a comment that comes up that you think is is uh, is topical and ready to do, just jump right in and, and let's chat about it. I, I love this sort of collaboration. It's great. Sure thing. All right, thank you. And keep the comments coming. Great job, guys. So how they've used this knowledge. So they've, they've obviously now begun to use the strategy deployment model, really understanding their business, understanding how it's fixed. Um, they've been driving a spirit of continuous improvement um, focus, and through Kaizen mostly, basic process improvement. But they've done some things. Since this presentation was originally created, they've actually done some pretty cool stuff. I'm going to very quickly go over some of these. I've got some excerpts or whatever, but it's, you know, you'll see this as a typical Kaizen format. It's pretty simple, pretty basic. But that's what I love about it. The basic is simple works best often. So, anyways, they've, they've thought about the recruiting process. You may remember a couple of slides ago we said, what did they learn? Well, having the right people on staff and keeping it on staff is critical to customer satisfaction. They made that connection. So, therefore, they actually did a uh, Kaizen event on the recruiting process. How in the world are we getting our people to, you know, how are we determining who the right people are to invite into the organization? Uh, they do a lot of travel. So how do we educate those people that are coming in uh, through the door that are potential uh, uh, employees? How do we let them know that's what to expect? Also, new hire onboarding. So once you get here, how do we get after it, right? So that, so we focus on making sure that you're here and you're a contributor. Uh, they use trailers, as I mentioned, all across the country. They want to they want to use visual management everywhere they can, and Quinn is absolutely a stickler for this. He's actually implemented 5S audits in their trailer, um, and assigned a, assigned a, a particular person that's the, kind of the rep for that, um, not responsible for doing it, but responsible for grading. And because it's one person, it's even all the way around. It's a little different than true 5S audits. I prefer a little bit more collaborative model with a group of leadership. But hey, what what Air Hygiene's doing? They've determined that it works for them, and anything else, I'm not going to stand in the way. Um, internal audit and prep for a new standard. They were the first lab, first mobile lab to receive um, NELAC accreditation, so it's very exciting for them. And um, they actually uh, uh, achieved that uh, the audit prep through a Kaizen event that we did, um, and so they were ready for the uh, auditors when that when that process started. 
And then last but not least, trailer loading and unloading again to reduce defects. If you're right in Montana and you don't have something that you need to complete your test, it can be quite, uh, quite upsetting because it's not like you've got a stack testing supplies for just down the street. A lot of the fracking activity that's going on across the country, air hygiene is chasing that because they're, they're out there helping uh, the gas compression uh, companies um, uh, qualify to the EPA standard. So as such, that's in pretty remote areas uh, for those of you that are around Pennsylvania and, and uh, well, western Oklahoma and up into the Dakotas and other areas. Um, this is an example, just an example of a playbook that they created. I mentioned that they've done a, 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 a focus on their university recruiting, on their recruiting itself. We looked at a number of different uh, value streams itself. This is university recruiting here that we looked at. This was their, I believe, their future state that they came up with. Um, this is just an excerpt from this. Potential employee uh, focus, um, how we process them, you know, how we basically move them in, and uh, what we do there. So again, just, just talking about it and plans for the future. Um, this is interesting. In their recruiting process, one of the things that they had decided is that they wanted to make sure that desperation did not creep in when recruiting. So again, this is a Kaizen or a top-level improvement priority that was established as a result of their strategy deployment. Um, but they went and executed because they recognized that retaining people, reducing turnover was absolutely critical. This is another one that they did. This is the kind of thing that they did as a result of the strategy deployment. Very similar to, to what we would do as a result of a, a future state value stream map where we have those constraints in our business processes. But again, these are a little bit more, um, a little bit higher level, a little bit more strategically focused. Um, maybe at more of an enterprise level, if you will. So this is their this is the Kaizen report uh, an excerpt from that uh, present, build presentable document uh, for five day for new hire training um, and that's, that's what we did we focused on a five day format but it's possible to find three day and six hour training formats depending on when people arrive and when their first job is that they need to go out on and so these again this is just an excerpt of the Kaizen and I'm just kind of skipping through it so you get an idea and you, again you'll have this whole entire presentation so you can take a look. Uh, they created a, a playbook on how to do this. They also created a, a corresponding set of slides that goes along with this playbook that participants go through whenever they're whenever they're going through their new hire orientation. So very very cool um, guys in there. Um, they focused a lot on how we uh, how we load and unload trailers to make sure that we don't leave things behind. And so that's what this ties in was all about. Again, another top level improvement priority. We said good grief if we're going to focus on defects, we've got to go out there to the trailers and talk about where things go. Um, establish that we've got to we've got to talk about the 5s compliance um, think about loading wear and tools and care um, we actually developed this 5s uh, trailer audit so there's, this is a score sheet and, uh, that they use um, and so you can see here the audit form actually takes in their 5s compliance and visual management compliance as well as how, the, how well loaded they they uh, they do it uh, as well as how well they uh, they manage the wear on their trailer uh, for non rolling control and then this is what I mentioned, the, the Kaizen event that we did preparing them for the internal audit for the new lack accreditation for their mobile labs. Um, this was the audit checklist that we actually um, reviewed and went through um, in a Kaizen event. So it's kind of an alternative way of conducting a, an internal audit. We can actually conduct an internal audit for the Kaizen event. I, I love PDCA. I can't get enough of it. But what's cool about it, um, their their next plans then were to think about mix, which we've sent, we've since done. We've done a kind of event in that regard, um, and also innovation, um, how they develop complementary revenue streams, and really interesting this emissions testing I talked about that they do on the drill tips now, specifically targeted in this area, mm -hmm. and very interesting to see how that's all developed. The trailer visual management enhancement. Uh, I mentioned that there's now audits going on and that people have scored, and so that's really being driven um, from the top and from the bottom. Uh, doing a great job there, really getting stuff going. Also, that's driving an improved um, focus on care and maintenance for the rolling stock. So when I say rolling stock, I specifically trailers and trucks. Uh, those things that are measured can be improved. We talked about constancy of purpose. Um, so setup reduction to improve customer satisfaction. Uh, setup reduction, we certainly focus on that. The customers want to have their stuff set up very quickly and get on get on with the test. And it's expensive to run some of this equipment. So they like to knock it out. And then Lean Six Sigma Greenbelt training. In fact, we've accomplished that. And they've actually got some strategic projects going on right now um, tied again to their strategy deployment. It's very interesting. They uh, had the director of 
or actually the CFO last week in the strategy deployment session referring to what is being learned on one of the projects in regards to profitability. So uh, the project is diving deep into profitability and reasons uh, why things are profitable and why they're not. Uh, that's pretty cool. So pull, when I get to this slide, I really want to talk a little bit about pull. We talk about pull as you know, track time and, and thinking of the customer and, and trying to match our pace of work to what that is. But you know, I like to think about it also in terms of a mark of a healthy continuous improvement culture. And um, so when you talk about continuous improvement, you talk about, well, you know, I, I would rather not go push Kaizen events on people. And I know you guys are probably, you know, faced with that in some regards by pushing a rope. We love it, though, as practitioners, don't we, when the organization asks us for their help. They say, man, I've got a metric that I can't seem to achieve, or, or something I'm focused on, my process is a bad actor, whatever. And so, so they, uh, they then reach in and say, man, can continuous, how can continuous improvement help me in this particular situation? So if we look at the second bullet point, I think you guys would recognize this, pull the force in an organization that triggers the process to do something. Now look what this next bullet point summarizes. In this case, the strategy, or really the vision becomes the internal pull and application of targeted CI. And I thought, I thought earlier, one of the comments was, you know, we really don't know where we're heading. Uh, it, it helps, it, you, you hit it right on the head, but the, the thing I say here is it helps avoid the nice shooting text approach and also random acts of continuous improvement. So um, anyways, I thought that's pretty cool. So, so pull is certainly a result of clear strategy. This is another opportunity though uh, Michael, we're going to, we're going to, and, and all, all the folks on the line, we're going to take a minute and just talk about strategy and, and pull of continuous improvement. And the real questions that we have here is why should strategy drive pull of continuous improvement? And also, how does this fit your particular business? So I'd just really be interested in your, in your comments here. So, so start typing away. We'll see if, uh, if I can see him, Mike, I see that you've sent some over. I think you may have copied those over for me. Um, we had one here. That's the question we had one earlier. Would you get in the car and start driving if you didn't know where you were going? And uh, amen to that. So uh, anyways, looking for responses to these two questions. Why should strategy drive pull of continuous improvement? And how does this fit your business? Thank you getting some uh, dissertation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this will be good comment, folks. Keep them coming. That's the whole point. It's not about me. This, this presentation is about you and kind of where it fits in your business, how it might work for you, and those sorts of things. So one person said... Um that uh, their business overlooks continuous improvement. They focus today, um, the focus is today primarily uh, to get her done. So they're, sorry, their business overlooks continuous improvement, but the focus is not today. Um, I see. And that certainly is a big challenge. You know, I'm not sure where we're getting some, some static in there. My apologies if that's coming from me. Uh, Another person says that uh, strategy alone need not drive pull of continuous improvement. Um, it is an operational efficiency as well, drive pull of continuous improvement. Agreed, agreed. Yeah, it's not only strategy, right? Exactly. Strategy certainly is something that should do it, but there's many, many other triggers as well. Great, great response there. And uh, one, person, uh, one person said yes and no, partly strategy and also operational excellence programs drive continuous improvement. Agree. You know, it's interesting that strategy, in my mind's eye, when I think of op operational excellence, you know, operational excellence really speaks to, in my mind's eye, the, the culture um, that's developed um, that really, really, you know, puts, puts continuous improvement at the core of the DNA of the business. And so OPEX is a key element, I think, of, of strategies and certainly should be a, a piece of it. So great observation there. Any other comments there, Mike, coming in? Yeah, one of them, um, one of them said, you know, he thinks far too many firms, uh, especially smaller ones, get trapped in day-to-day -day tactical business, keeping things running, and they feel like they just don't have time to focus on continuous improvement. You know, it's interesting. I, I wish I had some magic pixie dust that could make that go away. I think the the uh, responded there absolutely is on the right track. And for whatever reason, air hygiene was able to see through that. Um, I would say that it took a lot of perseverance. The very first 5S event we did, they had their skeptical hat on in a lot of regard. And it took us a while to get here. So if you're thinking about your own organization and maybe facing some of that resistance, you know, stay the course would be my recommendation. 
stay the course, keep after it, um, and help people see it from their own eyes, right? The power of going to Gimba is one of the most critical things. If they see the opportunities that exist in their business for themselves, um, you don't have to convince them of it. So, uh, you know, certainly in my book, Gimba Kaizen is, is one of the top reads that I have. Um, I still go back to it daily, or weekly anyways, um, especially when I'm training. I, there's so much great goodness in there. So uh, go back, take a look at that. That may help you. But again, stay the course. So Mike, with that, I think we're gonna we're gonna carry on here. I want to make sure we have an on time departure. That's always uh, always important for folks. And I really appreciate your comments. Uh, keep them coming. I look forward to the opportunity to uh, chat beyond this uh, this discussion today. So strategy deployment driven continuous improvement has air hygiene arrived? Absolutely not. In fact, they realize that CI continuous improvement is a journey, not a destination. And I'd already mentioned this idea about swarm. And I, again, I hope to talk with you guys about it some here and there. It's amazing to see the power of Swarm um, and being driven by a value stream manager now, which is pretty cool um, how they're doing that. But yeah, they're continuing to do internal innovation. And that's what I would really characterize their process improvements as being. And it's both PDCA Kaizen stuff as well as um, so as well as um, Demaic. So right, Lean Six Sigma Demaic. And I just got a question posed here. Chad made reference to a good process improvement book. The name of the book, there's two of them. Um, the first book is um, The High Velocity Edge by Stephen Spear. And the second book I would recommend is the book called Gimba Kaizen by Mai, I-M-A-I. So again, I, I think Mike, you typed in here. If we do not get a chance to, to do some Q&A, we'll take your questions and offer answers to you after the webinar, which we will do. I'll, I'll help out with that, no problem. Um, also, they're cascading the monthly opera operations review now to the masses, and we're going to see a slide of that. That was their first attempt. They've actually changed it a little bit now. And uh, although they would prepare, prefer to not share exact numbers at that particular time, they wanted to show trends. Now, it's interesting. They're actually starting to show more and more of their business to internal people. And I think that that's a key thing is as they begin to trust the process and trust the fact that knowledge, there's power in knowledge, the uh, air hygiene is actually softening on that idea. They're actually starting to show exact numbers to leaders in their business. But this was their first attempt at getting out to their to their business, um, just kind of a passing grade on how they're doing each and every month um, on their major um, strategy deployment metrics. So that's that's kind of what they're doing there. So I think as we kind of wrap this up, and we'll try to leave about five minutes here for Q and A. The final thoughts here, when you think about it, try your best. And I love the opex discussion because you're right. Strategy deployment is not the only thing that should drive pull on the continuous improvement initiative, but it certainly is one of the key elements that can and should be utilized to help position continuous improvement as the toolkit of choice to make sure we're achieving our breakthroughs. The other thing, though, is, is this idea of KISS, right? Keep it simple, stupid. Complex is not always better, so don't overthink it. If there's a recommendation I would make in regards to strategy deployment, don't try to create the most the biggest, the most complex business model you can imagine. Try to keep it simple. Simple is easily understood, easily communicated, and it's easy for people to understand that, okay, I sit where I sit today and we're all heading to Baltimore. I understand we're going to Baltimore. That's simple. I got it. So be very clear about that. It, the, the complex is not always better. Anywhere you can, as somebody mentions, mentions constancy of purpose, um, Air Hygiene is using the concept of playbooks throughout their business they're even using constant they're even using the concept of playbook for their strategy deployment so we actually pulled out their playbook uh, that we developed in the very first strategy deployment session we pulled it out last year when we did their annual review and we said okay what do we say we're going to do this time um, also set people up to succeed and drive their own improvements as related to breakthrough objectives from the strategy that is so critical that we get people out there close to the process right those people at Gimba we get them to drive their own improvements knowing the direction of the business, right, because they can understand how they relate to the overall strategy and how that particular process they're focused on is is related. So so with that, I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up. I'd love to hear from you. Link in with me. Uh, uh, link up with me on LinkedIn. Um, I'm out on Facebook, and um, and it'd just be, it'd be great for us to continue to collaborate. I, I love being an open book and love helping people, so um, it's too much fun out there. I love practicing continuous improvement. Mike, I'm going to I'm going to turn it over to you. I think that you had a little bit of a Q&A and some wrap-up that you typically do, correct? Yeah, um, we, have, we do have some questions. Uh, one, 
person was asking, uh, where's a good source for a completed X chart? Uh, obviously, it doesn't compromise real companies' proprietary strategies, but one that's filled out realistically. I can do that. I can send one. So have them send me an email. Okay. Or I can forward it to you. Let me let me just say, how about if I, well, why don't you just have them send me an email or work through you, whatever. Okay. Um, and then another person asked, what is a bowling chart? A couple people asked that, actually. Okay, great. That's a great question. It's a, it's a term commonly used associated with strategy deployment. Uh, a bowling chart, if you guys have been bowling before, you'll notice that you have different frames. And so a bowling chart really is just a, a fancy, fancy term for a graph that represents each month's target, and then below it, um, you have the actual performance for that particular month. And the reason we call it a bowling chart is because the columns across the chart itself uh, are the analogs to the frames in bowling, right? So frame one, frame two, so on, so on. So yeah, that's why we call it the bowling chart. I've also heard it referred to as the bowler. So that's kind of an insider term. So if you go to the, uh, you know, if you go to like the lean, the lean cocktail hour and you're trying to impress your friends, you can talk about having seen somebody's bowler and that'll mean something in strategy deployment circle. <laughs> Um, what is uh, the difference between Hoshi and Connery and balanced scorecard? You know, balanced scorecards to me, are, that's, an, that's another concept that's been out there for quite some time, developed in the 70s. Uh, balanced scorecarding is um, directly and closely linked to Hoshi and Connery. I think the concepts apply. Uh, balanced scorecarding itself is really just that. It's trying to link um, high levels of the organization to low levels of the organization, right? So. At a low level, I may be focused on a more finite metric than, and it would roll up into a higher level metric. But I think where it differs a little bit is it takes the concepts of, of, of the, uh, balanced scorecard, but it ties it more to those strategic, those, those, uh, more grand strategic initiatives from the top level of the business as, a, as opposed to maybe arbitrary initiatives. Um, that's where I think it may differ. And I'm sure there's a lot of opinion out there on that. So, but, uh, certainly the concept applies. Um, at least is related to, to driving it down, uh, deploying it down into the organization. I have a person with a statement. Um, before we had good change management program, before we had a good change management program, managers were making changes willy-nilly. Mm. But major changes require knowledge that no one manager has. A step toward improvement in one area caused issues in other processes. So we now consider the change will affect the company's strategic goals. Hmm. That is powerful, powerful stuff there. Right? The power of many heads in one room working on something that's a more of a cross-functional look, so much better than, than isolated, um, isolated continuous improvement. Outstanding observation to whomever made that. Nice, nice, uh, nice uh, thoughts there. And uh, I have one other question. Is ASQ on that list as part of you had a list of people that use Hoshin Connery. Was ASQ on that list as part of as using it, or as just having a template? I think that's on. Yeah, unfortunately, I think that's on the template. I I'm not certain that they use strategy deployment at the top level. So uh, if anybody knows out there knows something otherwise, I think some of the some of the group and I, and maybe the Lean Enterprise Division is actually one of them. But I think there may be some groups out there that actually use uh, strategy deployment. Um, so yeah. Some of the divisions, I think, yeah. um, I got another question. What is a good reference that would include the strategy deployment tools you used today? Man, I've been looking for one. Donnie Smith, the CEO at Tyson, asked me about a year ago for a good reference. Um, there is one called Hoshin Connery um, that's an academic study from the 70s and 80s. And it's very, very complex. And I, I, it flies in the face of really the way I practice it. Again, I learned when... I learned this process from Pentair Corporation when I worked there, and, and um, you know, line of sight improvement was so easy there. It was just such an easy process. It was based on the DBS, the Danaher Business System, of course, which came out of TPS, Threat of Production System. And so I have yet to find a good text that I really like. If somebody's got one out there, I would be very interested to hear. So um, please, have, if, you, if you know of one, let me know, because I'm actually looking for one. Um, so I got a comment. Somebody um, said that ASQ does use Hoshin Connery for the SAC strategy, SAC strategy. I'm not sure what SAC stands for. Um, also, it's been introduced to the board this year. Yay. That's exciting. That's great news.
outstanding. I think it's a wonderful tool. It needs to be up there. So maybe it was that was like foretelling the future by having their logo at the bottom corner. <laughs> Um, so I, I guess at this time uh, we'll, we'll probably have to um, end our, our discussion, but um, I really appreciate your taking the time out to, to help us understand um, these, these uh, concepts better. Um, it's really fun, interesting discussion. Um, I would agree, and just want to say thank you to everybody. Thank you for having me, and thank you for allowing me to speak today. It's been a lot of fun.